shifting to another one of Elon Musk's entities. In the fight to win a valuable NASA moon mission, SpaceX appears to be the front runner. NASA's administrator telling a Senate committee yesterday they're considering bypassing the use of its long delayed rocket for the upcoming mission to the moon and looking at commercial alternatives instead. This, of course, opens a door for SpaceX. Joining us now is Vector CEO and co-founder Jim Cantrell. Uh, Jim, thanks for being here. You were, My pleasure. You were a, uh, a former uh, member of the founding team yes, at SpaceX. Yes, I, I was there in the early days, and Elon Musk called me out of the blue in 2001 saying he wanted to do a private mission to Mars, and uh -huh. that became SpaceX. And now here we go. Yeah, well, I mean, let's talk about how this company is now positioning itself, because we talk about NASA and this particular mission, mm -hmm. choosing to opt instead for, for potentially SpaceX. Mm -hmm. why, why are they better positioned than some of these other companies out there for this? That's a great question. So the legacy companies are really a derivative of the military industrial complex, which is a private extension of the government and the way the government does business. I think the big thing that happened with SpaceX was, was Elon and his guys came in and they, and they deployed government capital when, when NASA gave them that money in a very efficient way. So for less than a billion dollars, he produced a Falcon 9 and, a, and a, a Dragon capsule, which could go to the space station. And, and now we're seeing SLS and, and you know, the, the NASA guys spending $50 billion mm -hmm. on Orion and, and that program, and they couldn't accomplish the same thing. Well, I mean, when we talk about the comparisons here, I mean, Boeing is also a name. Obviously, it's been in the news for other reasons. But another blow when we talk about how much they're spending to try and compete with SpaceX. Yeah. So, I mean, what's the problem there? Well, so, so Boeing is, is optimized as a company for different things. Mm -hmm. So when, when you're optimized to gather defense dollars and government dollars, you optimize around that system. So I've gone on record saying our, our defense acquisition systems, the Soviet economic system with a five-year plan and the government sets the price and the product. Mm -hmm. Whereas, you know, SpaceX arguably, I think, didn't come at it from that perspective. They came at it from a commercial product perspective and said, look, what do we think the market needs? And then the government became a, a customer of that. Really, the government might want to be tempted to build iPhones if they thought they could do it efficiently, but mm -hmm. we know that they couldn't, and so they buy iPhones. And that's really the same model that SpaceX is using. Got it. Right. So I'm wondering, because there's been a commercial interest in space, I think, for quite some time. Um, but it seems on the part of the government that they had taken a, a step back. Mm -hmm. um, why do you think that there has been such a push from the administration, essentially, to return to the moon? And with such haste. <laughs> yeah, so it's really part of NASA's plan that, that they've had in place a long time. So it's no secret that you know we went to the moon uh, you know 50 years ago and uh, did it very well. Haven't gone back since. So so NASA has long had this plan, and the moon is really a, a source of resource for potentially for the Earth. It's it's a place where you can observe things from, and it's a way station in many people's mind to settling the cosmos. And so NASA. I think his long time had this plan, and the administration uh, has a, probably a more commercial-friendly approach than we've seen in the past. Mm -hmm. And uh, you know, Jim Bridenstine, the NASA administrator, who's also a friend of mine, uh, in Congress was was very friendly towards commercial space as a way to save the government money. So what we see is a convergence of these forces, and I think it's net good for for the country. Do you think, though, that the average everyday consumer wants this? Do you think they see the value in going to the moon? I mean, I'm thinking I'm the mom of two boys who are 10 and 7, and they think it's crazy. Yeah. And they they want to go to Mars. They don't yeah. want to go to the moon. We did that already. We're done. So, so there's a rather large debate between Mars and the moon, right? right. Uh, I'm personally they in the Mars, Mars camp. Too. <laughs> yeah, I'd rather go to Mars if I could choose, right? Yeah. But I, I, I like it here on Earth, so that's just fine. <laughs> but uh, no, there's, there's a legitimate scientific debate between these two. And I think, you know, NASA views both of them as being legitimate scientific targets, and it's not an either or argument, I think is what it really comes down to. It's maybe one, then the other. Yeah, <laughs> that, that's the argument that we go to the moon, then we go to Mars. Yeah, Wait, one step at a time. Before we let you go, though, I have to ask you about what it is like to work with Elon Musk. If you think that there is <laughs> genius to the madness, uh, given that your, uh, your ties with him in the yeah. past and all of the controversy, are yeah. you surprised by all the controversy that you've been seeing? Or do you think this is par for the course for Musk? Um, so if you can give there. us a, a brief a insight a to, to his mind, essentially. Yeah, no, no, Elon's a brilliant guy, right? And if Elon, if you're listening, I love you. I admire what you do. So, and, and truly, I, you know, I listened to your Tesla discussion just a minute ago, and the guy has a huge ambition, and he has ambitions about changing the way humanity lives. And for a lot of people, that's, that's really spectacular, important. 
And uh, so, so in that sense, he's an unusual character, I think, in the existence of human history. And, uh, you know, we all have our faults and, uh, you know, maybe too much Twitter and not enough sleep for Elon, but <laughs> uh, hey, aren't we all guilty of that? So, yeah. so to work with him is, is difficult. You're either in with Elon 100%, maybe 120%, or, or you're out, right? And that's why I left because, you know, I could see he wanted to go to Mars and, and I just didn't see that being successful. I've been wrong about Elon all along. And that's why I left a year into the to the existence. But he's very demanding. He's 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 he works. You know, he's leading from the front. He's always out there, and he's very very involved. He understands absolutely everything about the products that he sells. Yeah, just can't keep him off Twitter. That's what. <laughs> well, just do you think that's podcasts. why other people have left the company? That you know they might disagree with his strategy. I, I think the direction it's that he no. I think going? it's more a case of burnout. Honestly, I think you know to keep up with the man is really tough. And so a lot of people I know that have left, some of my good friends were, you know, part of the founding team, have left because they just got tired, right? And we only have so much energy. Elon seems to have more of that than all of us. <laughs> and, uh, you know, there's some people that disagree with him. There's some people that, that can't deal with his personality. And then there's most of them that are there absolutely love the man. They worship the ground he walks on. And, you know, he's, he and his team and Gwen Shotwell, have, and Gwen's an old friend, uh, you know, they, they have, have accomplished great things. And it, is, be very proud. it is a lot easier to follow someone who works hard and you see them working hard in the office and even sleeping in the office. Exactly. That certainly makes it easier. And all of that is very true. All right. Well, Jim Cantrell, thanks so much for much joining pleasure. us. Appreciate Thank you. being here.